welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slick Bell. On the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, the aerospace industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. And this week, we take an interesting look into an era that seems to be long gone, but its lessons are now more relevant than ever. We are talking about nuclear standoff with the USSR, or in today's context, Russia. We have the honor to discuss the events leading up to one such standoff with an airman who is there to witness history unfold before him. All of this is classified, of course, until now. Our guest, Brian Mora, is a former United States Air Force Intel officer, senior executive, and board member in the aerospace industry, leading numerous defense firms over the past few decades. Brian is also a talented author and just released his latest novel this week titled The Able Archers. Now, The Able Archers is a fictional story of two Intel officers, one Soviet, the other American, that is based on the newly declassified events that nearly led to a nuclear world war. Based on his real-world experience, the Able Archers has already earned many endorsements, most notably from Robert M. Gates, CIA Deputy Director from 1982 to 1986 during the time of the Able Archers incident. Now, to our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. And as a quick reminder, please do us a favor and subscribe to our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Well, Brian, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, John. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it, it's really been a pleasure to to get to know you and in anticipation for the release of the book on March 22nd. Just give us a quick snippet of your background. I know that uh, you and General Deptula have personally worked together while uh, you were in the military and uh, have remained friends. So yeah, please give us that background. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, well, I started out in our business um, as an Air Force intelligence officer I served on active duty for about nine years and left to go to industry, but I stayed in the reserve. And that's where I crossed paths originally with uh, Dave Deptula. I worked in Checkmate during Desert Shield and Desert Storm for John Warden, the legendary Colonel John Warden. (laughs) Absolutely. And and then, uh, and Lieutenant Colonel at the time, Dave Deptula, was working in Checkmate, and as I'm sure many of our listeners know, he was pulled to work in the black hole in Riyadh uh, during the final run-up to the war and uh, and during Desert Storm itself. So I've I've known Dave since then. I, I was working back in Washington at Checkmate. I actually had a broken pelvis at the time, at the time, so I, I couldn't really go anywhere. <laughs> oh my gosh! And, uh, but I worked with John Warden. Um, the role I played for John and supportive Dave and the guys forward in the black hole was helping to coordinate some of the intelligence collection with the three-letter agencies, particularly with DIA and with the NRO at that time. So yes, and we've we've kept in touch over the years, and I, I knew him when he was when Dave was in the Pentagon and was the A2 and, and so forth. And, and certainly admire the work that you and he and everybody at the Mitchell Institute does for not only the air force, but for national defense in general. Well, well, thank you for that. And, and um, yeah, we had the opportunity uh, with a 30 year anniversary of desert storm to have, you know, both John Warden uh, and general Taptula and among others, uh, talk about their experience. So again, thank you for your work during that time. I can only imagine going to work every day and I've been in Checkmate and I worked with those folks quite a a bit when I was in the Pentagon myself. I can just only imagine the intel that you were sifting through on a daily basis, hourly basis, uh, as you were building the plan. Yes, it was, uh, it was a daunting task and it was, um, it was it was a good example though of the three letter agencies really coming together with the Air Force and the rest of DoD and in supporting the plan and and then supporting the execution of the war. After that time frame, I I stayed in the reserve for a bit and actually I, I Colonel John Warden asked me to come down and help him at Air Command and Staff College as he put together a new curriculum. So I did that as a reserve officer. 
and then I, I left the reserve. I had a fairly lengthy career in the aerospace and defense industry. So I finished up my career at Northrop Grumman and since retiring um, on some corporate boards and and most importantly, I'm writing the Able Archer series, which is uh, my real passion. Absolutely. And so let's dive right into that. And thank you for all the continued work with, with the industry partners, because obviously the uh, the military can't do what, what they do without the, the leadership uh, that you've provided in, in that role. So, uh, but let's rewind a bit, right? So you mentioned you were on active duty for nine years. So doing the math in my head, that's, uh, you know, before you were doing uh, your bit with Desert Storm. So you were in it as an intelligence officer in the 80s, during the time where essentially the height of the Cold War, where we had two nuclear superpowers with the idea of mutually assured destruction being the thing that would uh, prevent us from ever doing a nuclear war. And if you could walk us through what you experienced and what brought you to uh, writing this uh, amazing book that's going to come out uh, this month. Yes. Well, thanks for that, John. Um, Yeah, the background to the Able Archers uh, and why I wrote the book is that I did want to share my personal experience, at least in in a portion of the nuclear war crisis that played out in the fall of 1983. And I I wrote a novel rather than a nonfiction work because I I was hoping and still am hoping (laughs) that we reach uh, a larger audience with a novel than one might with a nonfiction work. Another reason I decided to write this after I retired is that information about the fall of 1983, the crisis of 83 became more accessible. And that was largely through the efforts of the National Security Archive folks at George Washington University here in in Washington, they were able to get a lot of key U.S. documents declassified beginning in 2015, and they're still doing so. In fact, uh, one of the most important documents regarding the Able Archer crisis was just declassified in February of 2021. And that was uh, the end of tour report by an Air Force officer, Lieutenant General Leonard Perutz, who, when he retired, was director of DIA. But prior to that had been what's now the A-2 on the air staff. And prior to that, and during the Able Archers crisis, he was the the IN, the A-2 at USAFE. And he actually played a very key role in diffusing the nuclear war crisis of 83. My personal experience was really at the front end of the crisis. And the first event that really triggered the crisis was the Soviet shoot down of a Korean airliner, KAL-007, on the 1st of September, 1983. And the, the crisis kind of unfolded from there. So one of the things that I do in the book is I talk a great deal about each of the three crises, but uh, again, my personal perspective on the first one is is uh, is something I was able to bring to the table that is perhaps unique. Yeah, absolutely, and and I do want to dive in there and paint the picture a little bit uh, because you know I get to see you uh, here on uh, while we're recording this. Uh, you know, very young looking man, but this is forty years ago almost, right? So, were you a lieutenant, a captain? Uh, where were you stationed, and and how were you observing this uh, this crisis unfold? Right. I, I was a captain. Uh, I was a pretty, a very new captain. In fact, uh, a story that I didn't tell in the book is that Lieutenant General Charles L. Donnelly Jr., who was the commander of U.S. Forces Japan and Fifth Air Force at the time, actually frocked me as a captain, which is an unusual thing because... Well, it, that does not happen very often. No. And, and he did that because he wanted me to brief the commander in chief of Pacific command as a captain, rather than as a first lieutenant, (laughs) he thought that would give me (laughs) a little bit more credibility. Um, And I, it probably did. Uh, So yeah, I was a a very young captain. I was stationed at Yokota air base, which is located. Many of you probably know in the Western suburbs of Tokyo. Uh, And it is where, both U.S. Forces Japan and Fifth Air Force are headquartered. My job at the time was 
I was the chief of intelligence analysis for Fifth Air Force Intel and U.S. Forces Japan J-2. It kind of melded together. And I had a group of of analysts working for me. A lot of them had a signals intelligence background. Some had an imagery background. Some of them had a human intelligence background. It was really an all source kind of gang of guys. And uh, so that's, that's where I was. And that's uh, what I was doing at, at the time of the KL 007 shoot down to get into the detail of that a little bit. Um, I would actually say that the crisis of 83 really began in April of 1983. The U.S. Navy conducted its largest Pacific Fleet exercise since World War II in late March and early April of 83. And they sent three carrier battle groups up into the Sea of Okhotsk, which the Soviets then and the Russians now consider to be an inland sea. It's bounded by the Siberian coast, the Kamchatka Peninsula, Sakhalin Island, and the Kuril Islands. And they and the Soviets then and the Russians today use it as a bastion for hiding their nuclear ballistic missile submarines. So the, the Soviets took this exercise to be very provocative. At the conclusion of the exercise, as two of the U.S. carrier battle groups were exiting the Sea of Okhotsk uh, through the Kuril Island chain, F-14s and F-4 fighters actually overflew Soviet territory. And wow. um, the F-4s conducted mock bomb runs on a Soviet military facility. Oh, my gosh. And that, as you can imagine, really triggered a major reaction on the on the part of the Soviets. On the day it occurred, however, uh, the Soviets had an air defense fighter interceptor base in the Kuril Islands. It was equipped with MiG-23s, which were pretty new aircraft at that time. And they failed to launch. They failed to launch any of their alert fighters uh, in response to this overflight. As a result, there was a big purge of Soviet air defense officers in the Soviet Far East. And they started, the Soviets started to react very provocatively to all of our intelligence collection flights throughout the Far East. So all of our RC-135s, U-2s, even the SR-71s, the Navy EP-3s were getting swarms of fighters reacting to them on a daily basis, some of which, some of those fighters uh, exhibited hostile intent by arming their weapons and it was it was a very fraught situation our crews were understandably a bit concerned by these reactions and if you go back into the history of the cold war the soviet union had shot down many of our uh intel collection flights uh the u2 uh, gary powers incident being the most famous but there were a number of aircraft that were shot down that the United States government kept secret uh, until the 1990s. So our crews knew that history and they were worried, even though the Soviets had not shot down an aircraft in some time, uh, the whole situation was pretty dicey. And so me and my team, we put together an analysis of what the, what the Soviets were doing and uh, briefed it to the crews down at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa um, and briefed it in Hawaii to the commander in chief of Pacific command, as I said. And one of the things, um, the, uh, commander at, at PACOM asked me, which is now Indo PACOM at the conclusion of my briefing was, will they shoot, you know, these Soviets are acting very provocatively. You've told me that if, if they perceive one of our aircraft to be a border violator, they might even shoot it down. His question to me was, would they shoot down a civilian airliner that might go astray? And I, I told him, quite honestly, we really hadn't even thought about that. But um, given the situation, I, I, my answer was, I think if they see it as a border violator, they'll try to contact it. They'll try to get it to land. If they can do neither, then all bets are off. They may shoot it down. That was the situation that led up to the Korean airline shoot down. 
John, uh, I was personally on duty that night. Gosh. Korean airliner was shot down. I, if people in the Air Force know for senior command level, you do a daily or near daily intelligence briefing for the commander. So it was my shop that was responsible for putting that briefing together every day. And I just happened to assign myself to give the briefing that particular day, the 1st of September, 1983. So I was on duty that night uh, when all of this went down. And I, and I do describe it in, in a lot of detail uh, in the book, how it all kind of came together. And, and admittedly, some of it, I dramatize a little bit, but, I didn't need to dramatize it too much. It was pretty dramatic in real life. Sure. Wow. Well, you know, having this conversation just makes me think about two things. Number one, there was so much going on during this Cold War that many Americans just didn't even realize was happening to include folks getting fired, you know, that you mentioned uh, on the Soviet side for not responding to our folks doing uh, exercises and why exercises make headlines and that type of thing. And then the other part is the empowerment of, of airmen. For some folks listening to this might go, oh, wow, a first lieutenant or a young captain being in charge. But that's the level of responsibility that the intel community has with their folks, because you're getting that, you know, on the job experience dealing with this stuff uh, on a daily basis. So it's really incredible what happened. And uh, obviously the the youth and empowerment of, of our airmen that are out there are just absolutely incredible. Yeah, that's a great point, John. In fact, I was giving a talk about the Able Archers to a group of retired intelligence officers from the military and from the civilian agencies uh, just, gosh, about 10 days ago. And and one of the guys in the audience was very skeptical. He's, he said, wait a minute, you were a captain and you briefed the sink at PACOM? That doesn't happen. And I said, well, it did happen. And I, I briefed him not only that in that instance, which was weeks just prior to the shoot down, uh, but he came to Japan shortly after the shoot down occurred because things were really dicey with the Soviets and he wanted to be on the scene firsthand. And I briefed him again. And, uh, and just a day or two after that, um, secretary of defense, Casper Weinberger came to Tokyo and I was the one that briefed him, uh, so as a very young guy, yeah, you're right. I mean, we we expect a lot of our young officers and airmen and NCOs. And in my experience is that they deliver. You know, they certainly yeah, did absolutely. deliver for me. Absolutely. Well, you know, I do want to hop into a, another part of, of the book um, that you have the ability with, with your intel background, obviously telling the U.S. side, but now there's another character uh, in the Able Archers that uh, brings another viewpoint. Can you uh, talk to us about that quickly? Sure. So the American character is based loosely on me, and he's a blend of my experience and experience of other folks, and, and his name is Kevin Katani. On the Soviet side of the ledger, the Russian side of the ledger, is a full colonel, and his name is Ivan Levchenko. And Levchenko is a GRU, Soviet military intelligence officer. Uh, he is a graduate of the Soviet Air Force Academy that was located, ironically enough, the, um, today in Kiev in Ukraine. That was in, in the days of the Soviet Union, that Air Force Academy was one of the best military academies in the Soviet Union, uh, noted for its engineering and scientific prowess, especially. So uh, Levchenko is a GRU officer trained at the academy. And then uh, after graduating from the Air Force Academy, he goes to the Military Political Institute, which is where GRU officers and KGB officers in some cases are trained uh, outside Moscow. And that's a three year school. So he went to a four year academy. And then right after that, to the three year political military Institute. So Levchenko, his backstory is he was born in on Crimea, which is in the news today. And, but he's an ethnic Russian goes to the air force Academy in Kiev, where he meets a Ukrainian woman and, and gets married to a Ukrainian. So there's this 
dynamic of Ukrainian versus Russian throughout the book and throughout the whole series, actually. And I, I did intentionally want to set that up, even though I, I wrote this book three years ago now, uh, as, as part of the tension in this, within the Soviet Union, this tension between the Ukrainians and the, and the, and the Russians. Uh, Levchenko is most readers who've had an opportunity to be advanced readers of the Able Archers um, really like Levchenko. <laughs> uh, they, and he's a, he's a very sophisticated, erudite kind of guy. He's multilingual. He speaks English fluently. Uh, another part of his backstory is, again, he grew up on Crimea, but he was uh, taken from his family at age six. And this was something that they did do in the Soviet days. He was taken from his family at age six and sent to Sevastopol, which is a city in Crimea. It's the big port city. It's where the Black Sea Fleet is headquartered. And he was sent to an English school, which was a school K through 12, where Russian kids were sent to be immersed in English language, in English and American literature, English and American and Western European history. So he finishes that school fluent in English and then goes off to the Air Force Academy. So he's a he's a very uh, knowledgeable about the United States, very knowledgeable about the West. And he actually, uh, just prior to the period of the Able Archers, he serves with the Soviet military liaison mission in Frankfurt, West Germany for three years. So he actually, he and his wife lived in Frankfurt, West Germany for a period of three years. So again, he knows the West much, much better than most people in the Soviet Union, even Soviet military officers. Yeah. And, and I, I can't tell you enough how it, I'm just blown away at the, the level of detail that, you, that you've gone into uh, the character creation in order to tell the very historic and accurate story of of what happened in real life that, you know, you, you've articulated it so well w- with these characters to make it really enjoyable for those that don't just want to read uh, history textbooks to, to understand uh, uh, how things played out and how we were on the brink of, of nuclear war. And, you know, I just really, really appreciate uh, the, the artistry that you've done to uh, to bring this uh, to all of us that, that love studying about uh, our, our history and especially air power and things like that. Um, I, I did want to um, take some time, though, Brian, w- with your background and experience and how you've been able to dive into unclassified intelligence uh, documents to to write the book to really hop into what we are seeing in the current day, because uh, you lived it, obviously. Uh, you've studied it. You've written about it. And uh, I really want to get your take on how you see, as we're into the third week of, of this war, watching the Russians and uh, initially just get your, your first take. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I, I'd like to just make one point, John, before we dive into that, which is for the benefit of all of those listening who have held security clearances or still do, that this book, The Able Archers, and and subsequent books in the series have all gone through the proper clearance process uh, with OSD. Um, OSD has an Office of Pre-Publication Review, and I send them the manuscripts. They review it. They send it out to other parts of DOD, and they send it out to the intelligence community for review so uh, these books take between six and 12 months, actually, for review, which is one reason for the delay <laughs> in getting this published. Um, my third book took 12 months to the day to get uh, reviewed and, and, and approved. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the, the folks in that office are tremendously professional and they've um, uh, and I, I've only had a, to make a, a small number of redactions in books uh, from a couple of the intel agencies wanted me to, to make. So, okay, so the current situation in, uh, in Eastern Europe, there are certainly some parallels and there's some differences with what uh, we experienced in the fall of 83. Clearly, the threat of nuclear war hangs over what's going on today, just as it did in 83. 
and Putin is using the threat of nuclear war at, very skillfully as a weapon to constrain NATO action. Uh, we've all seen that. We've seen it most recently with the no-fly zone debate and with the transfer of May 29 debate. So there, the specter of nuclear war or an escalatory arc is something that is similar to what happened in 83. I, I would say that in a couple of other similarities, the Soviet leader in 1983 was a guy named Yuri Andropov, and Andropov had been chairman of the KGB for over 20 years before uh, becoming the leader uh, of the Politburo, and, and he succeeded Leonid Brezhnev in late 1982. And Dropov was a very paranoid guy who didn't trust the West, didn't trust NATO, was extremely worried about a potential nuclear first strike from the United States to NATO. He was very isolated from world opinion. He, he didn't really know much about the West. At the time of the crisis in 83, Andropov had serious health issues. He was actually terminally ill and died just a few months after this crisis. Putin, for his part, we all know that he had a, has a KGB background as well. Uh, he was a career officer and served quite a bit of time in East Germany, including he was assigned to Dresden, East Germany, when the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, he saw the, the subsequent collapse of the Soviet Union, and that's when he left the KGB and went to work for the mayor of that, what was then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Again, today, Putin has that KGB background. He's, he's very isolated from world opinion, from public opinion. He has a very tight inner circle of advisors uh, who are loathe to contradict him. In fact, I think his situation in that regard is somewhat different than Andropov. Um, Andropov had a, was a member of the leader of, but what was a very powerful Politburo and the other guys on that Politburo had their own power centers. And that's not true today with, uh, with Putin. Putin really has more of an absolutist kind of power akin to a czar than really any of the Soviet leaders with the possible exception of Stalin. Right. Putin also views NATO with great hostility. As we know, he views NATO as an offensive alliance that has since the <clears throat> collapse of the Soviet Union has expanded right up to his borders. The red line that he drew on Ukraine uh, is something that he articulated as early as 1999 when he became acting president and then subsequently president of Russia. Uh, and, and that red line on Ukraine is not really unique to Putin. Uh, Gorbachev said the same thing. Yeltsin said the same thing. So there's been a consistency in Russian leadership, post-Soviet leadership, in, in drawing a red line around around Ukraine. So again, some of those similarities, as I mentioned, um, and some dissimilarities, but the, the one constant is this specter of a potential escalation to nuclear conflict that right. is common to both the able archers in the situation today. Absolutely. And, and I know we, we're getting a, a little long on time, um, yep. and, and I, I wish we had hours because we could talk for hours, Brian, on, uh, with all of your experience. But with the similarities that uh, you've, you've studied and written about uh, in your book to how things are unfolding today, uh, based on your experience, what advice would you give to uh, either political or senior leadership or uh, other folks uh, in the military, be it the Air Force, Space Force, on, on what things they should be thinking about as, uh, as history unfolds before us? Well, I think one bit of advice would be that I, I think we need to focus more attention on Europe. That's not to say that I disagree with the notion that China is, China is the pacing threat. 
as Secretary Kendall said uh, recently, and and it remains the pacing threat. It will be the enduring threat. But Europe is still important, and Russian aggression and the Russian approach to interacting with other powers is still important. And I, I think that our knowledge of Russia is, generally speaking, a little bit thin compared to what it was back in the 1980s. And, you know, it's a natural evolution, I think, from the fall of the Soviet Union and the wars that we've been conducting in the Middle East and Southwest Asia. Um, it's understandable, but I do think it, we, we would benefit from having uh, a deeper and broader sense of what makes Russia tick and, and why Putin is doing the things that he's doing and why the Russian leadership is. So that would be one thought. A second thought is that this is a very perilous situation. I, I don't discount that. However, I also believe that the Russians, like the Soviets before them, do respect strength. They do respect resolve. And while I, I know we've shown that in terms of the deployments and the shoring up of the eastern flank of NATO, I think we could be doing more in Ukraine, but our window of opportunity to do more in Ukraine is, is closing rapidly. I would have liked to have seen us have been much more forward leaning and support to Ukraine in the months leading up to this. I, we saw the buildup, you know, kind of in slow motion of, of Russian forces uh, in Belarus and uh, along the Ukrainian border. And I think those signals should have prompted a more resolute set of actions on the part of the alliance to, to help. Ukraine and supply them with military equipment earlier than we've done. But that's hindsight. I think our options now, because that window of opportunity is closing, I think our options are limited, but showing determination, determined resolve is going to be important. And I, I do think that as inflationary pressures build within the United States, that I think that's going to be more difficult to do politically. And we have a major, you know, we have a midterm election coming up in November and those political considerations are going to be top of mind for a lot of people in our political leadership. So I think just staying the course is important. And I think there's going to be increasing pressure on politicians to maybe not stay the course because of what's happening economically. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. We are we're definitely living in uh, unique times, but uh, you never know. The uh, the first lieutenant or brand new captain may be uh, thinking about the book that they're going to write in forty years. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully we uh, we do uh, stay resolute in, uh, in in fighting tyranny around the world and, uh, and and stop the atrocities that are happening over there. So, but Brian, I cannot say thank you enough for uh, making the time to be on the Aerospace Advantage. And we will have links again to. Uh, where you can find out more about Brian and where you can find out uh, more about ordering the book. And uh, I tell you, I, I cannot wait for this thing to come out and, uh, and hopefully I'll get to meet you in person and you can sign my copy. Love to do it. And I appreciate your efforts and all, all that you do with the Mitchell Institute and uh, hats off to you. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to chat with you today. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.